one of the one of the most surprising features of the stories about the appearances of Jesus after he was raised from death is that these appearances are so hidden and short. In most cases, Jesus only appears to a few people at a time, his closest associates in a room, two people on a journey, Mary weeping at his tomb. The people to whom he appears are not expecting the leader who they have seen publicly executed on a cross and buried in a tomb to come and meet them. So when he does come and appears in this totally unexpected fashion, they're frightened. But the risen Jesus assures them that he's not come to frighten, but to befriend. He's come to assure them that the presence that is before them is the same Jesus that they saw crucified and buried. He comes in a visible, even touchable manner, not just as an idea, a hope, a dream, or a vision. But these appearances do not last for long, just long enough to convince his followers that he is alive in a new way, in a new way which will also give them new life. But he's not going to remain continuously with them in this manner. So what's the purpose of these appearances of Jesus? Let me suggest some reasons for their taking place. First, Jesus' appearance indicates that he's been successful. Jesus spent his rather short life witnessing to the constant generous commitment of God to promote fullness of life. He meets opposition in people's sickness of body and mind, their doubt, their fear, their conceit, their greed, their viciousness. That opposition finally brings about his arrest, condemnation, and crucifixion. But even when confronted with an agonizing public death, he refuses to recant, to run away, or to seek revenge. Instead, he trusts God to use his death to demonstrate that he, Jesus is witnessing to the truth. By the integrity of his death and by being given life beyond death, Jesus' success in overcoming everything that might deny the truth of his witness, that success is revealed. Second, because he's been successful, God has honored him with life beyond death. He can continue his witness about God and God's life-giving purpose. More than ever, he can be shown to be the closest, clearest, and most complete revealer of God's presence. So Jesus appears in order to be recognized as God's full presence in a human life. That revelation, however, has not occurred by Jesus' perfect keeping of the law or by his correct offering of sacrifice. This revelation has occurred because of Jesus giving his life giving his life to honor God and to help humanity. Therefore, this new revelation indicates that God has brought about a new development in the divine purpose. Through the witness of Jesus, God has shown that relationship with God for everyone, past and present, is based upon accepting God's generous character and liberating commitment. The appearances of the risen Jesus communicate a new era of inclusiveness in God's plan for the world. Lastly, Jesus' appearances to specific people indicate that God wants to share the divine presence, achievement, and spirit with individuals. God wants to influence people, individual person by individual person, at the depth of their being and to bring forth from them their own satisfying contribution to the coming of the divine community. I suggest these are some of the wonderful and great purposes of the appearances of Jesus risen from the dead. However, whilst these great and wonderful purposes were being made known to Jesus's followers, the world outside was carrying on as normal. There was the same amount of sickness, poverty, fear, viciousness. The world outside was not changed, but these followers of Jesus were changed. 
so that afterwards they began to give their witness to what they'd seen and heard and handled first in Jerusalem, then Judea, Galilee, Samaria, around the Mediterranean, and even to far more distant places, often losing their lives in the process. And that witness has never ceased. That witness of arousing in people an awareness of God's presence for us, God's acceptance of us, God's partnering with us. An awareness of God which will result in people supporting the dignity, justice, and development of others. Surely this witness has been continued because those who have been convinced by the life and death and resurrection of Jesus cannot hold back from sharing the best that they know, both about God and about the inclusive community and commonwealth God intends for his world. Viewed from that conviction, what opposes the divine purpose only shows its unworthiness to continue. We have the privilege and responsibility of continuing that witness and that transformation. And that brings us to the recognition that Wednesday is Earth Day. Earth Day, which reminds us that the most urgent, essential transformation that must take place on our planet is our interaction with our environment, yes, but even more deeply with the organization of our global economy. The technical industrial revolution of the past 200 years, followed by the information revolution, has resulted in what I have come to call the economy of death. Yes, these revolutions have brought great improvements to human health, wealth and education for which we are and should be very grateful and want to retain. However, the constant determination for growth in wealth through providing ever more accessible and increasing possessions has led to the destabilization of the mutually life-sustaining systems of our planet, choking the atmosphere, polluting the air, water, and earth, exterminating a large variety of living things, causing large areas of land to be overwhelmed by floods, fire, and drought. This is the only life-supporting planet that we know. This is the planet which God has demonstrated through Jesus Christ that the divine purpose is the development of fullness of life. Our planet, though, is sick and dying because, frankly, of us, we humans, who are one and only one of its creatures. So as humans and above all as Christians, we have the responsibility of giving the earth the same compassionate, courageous, committed caring that our doctors and nurses are giving to those suffering from COVID-19. That, I believe, requires at least three major commitments from us. First, replacing carbon-based energy quickly with non-carbon sources. The oil, the gas, the coal has to stay in the ground. Second, directing globalized investment and trade to increasing majority well-being, not minority increase of wealth. Third, basing international security on developing mutual benefits rather than mightier weapons. These are three objectives I believe that Christians should be supporting with their hearts, minds, speech, and voting, and making it clear in the process that they're doing so because their faith, hope, and love are based on the God who raised Jesus from the dead to eternal glory, the God who eagerly shares the life-giving Holy Spirit with any who are open to the divine presence. Many Christians are already giving this witness. We here at Incarnation have been finding ways of doing so and have plans and hopes 
for doing more by redesigning the use of our grounds and by placing solar panels on suitable parts of our roof. And if you want to find out more about how you can, as an individual or family, make your contribution to the restoration of the life of the planet, you should check out the Earth Day website, which is on the e-bulletin for this week. There are mentioned numerous actions which are quite possible to manage. We have the inspiration for hope. We have the grounds for faith. We have the motivation for caring. The work of Jesus goes on. Jesus lives. May Jesus become all in all. Hallelujah.